The Powers Project. Robert, thanks for joining me today, sir. How are you? Doing well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Oh, it's my pleasure. I always like to have positive people on my show. And you, um, I'm going to tell you, I've been very fortunate. These last several episodes, I've had some of the most positive people I've ever met in my life, and you just happen to be one of them. And so I'm, awesome. I'm really happy to, to, it's almost like, you know, you put that, you put that out to the universe and it brings back to you, you know, sort of, sort of thing. So, um, yes. so you, what you do is you are an you're an international speaker. And what you do is you, you teach people how to become empowered through telling their own stories. Is that right? That is correct. It's, it's a skill that, that I had that I didn't even really know I had that I could take it, you know, outside of my own circle, but it's being pretty well, well pretty well received. So can't complain there. So how does that work exactly? Because, because, you know, when we think about it, we, we've always heard that, you know, storytelling is such a powerful, um, a powerful way to, to get your message out there. Yet not everybody has that ability or has that skill to tell their stories properly. It's sort of like being a comedian. Everyone thinks they're a comedian until they try to tell a joke and they, you know, they don't have the timing. They don't have the punchline down. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that wasn't really the, your greatest attempt. So how do you teach people to, to tell their story in a way that it's, that it becomes powerful for them? Well, I've never had an issue with public speaking, but I joined a speaker boot camp through Eric Thomas's group. Of, this was back in 2017. And so I had gotten my, my story together. So I'm going to go down there. I'm going to rock this thing. And so it was down in Atlanta. And so there were 41 other people in the room. And Eric Thomas was actually present on day two when I spoke. And so I get up there, my turn, and I'm doing my thing. I'm telling my story. I got the right tonality. I got the right pitch. I'm making eye contact. People were dialed in on me, and I thought I killed it. And so the next day, I land back in Boston, and I'm driving back down here to Rhode Island, and my phone rings, and it's the CEO, CJ. And so he, I answer. He's like, hey, Robert, just wanted to thank you for coming down. He's like, I have to tell you, so that of all of the speakers, he said, you were by far the most polished. And I was like, go ahead. Right. <laughs> and I was feeling myself for a second. I was like, go ahead. But then he paused. And you know, the pause is never good. Right. <laughs> so I was like, oh, crap, here it comes. And he says, but you're my most frustrating type of student. Hmm. And I said, all right, be the sponge. All right, I'm all ears. And he says, your, your story was so polished. He said, you probably told it hundreds and hundreds of times that there was no emotion in it. And then he brought up this guy, Eric. He's like, Eric was probably the worst speaker there, but he touched people. He says, you are good at telling your story. He said, but I didn't feel anything from you. And then he gave me some details at the time. I had lost my job in 2009, my, my uh, restaurant management job. My now ex was pregnant with twins, our fourth and fifth children. Wow. And so she was right, right around seven months, seven months pregnant when I lost my job. And so I was telling that part of the story and he broke it down. He says, you know, what were your initial thoughts when you lost your job? You know, what was going through your mind as you were calling your ex to tell her as she's pregnant with twins? What was the tone of her, her voice? Like, how did she receive the information? Like, when you, when you pulled in your driveway, what were your thoughts before you went, in, you went into the house to face her? What was it like when you first locked eyes with her? And I was like, holy crap, this is like levels, levels deep. Right. He says... He says, you know, you told the story about you. He said, you have to tell the story about me. If you want me to be moved by your story, if you want me to buy into your programs or to read your book or to read your blog or to go to your website, he's like, I have to be moved. And that one phone call changed everything with how I speak now, because he was absolutely right. I was speaking about me. So obviously, when you tell your story, you're telling your story, but you have to flip it into the lens of the listener. It's like, what parts of my story are going to resonate with the audience? And so that's what I help people do, because a lot of people, when they tell their story, they're talking about them and they're not really taking me into their story. So I tell people it's kind of like watching a movie. 
So like you watch a movie and if you get a really good one, you're on the edge of your seat the whole time. Like you're not you're not thinking about about your phone. You're not thinking about what you got to do after. Like you are locked into the movie. So I help people get their stories so powerful and passionate that it locks people into it. That's you know, that's a great point, because I, you know. I, I, I'm thinking while you're saying I'm thinking, yeah, you know what? I think that's what I do. I think when I tell a story, <laughs> I'm telling my story and not, you know, and not thinking about how it affects the person that I, or people that I'm talking to. And, yes. And that's the most important part. If you want your story <laughs> to be <achieved. laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's so it's so true because too, too many times, you know, we're worried about just what we went through. So what that moment taught me is everything that I've gone through, what was the lesson in it? So if there's someone, well, an, an, another quick example. So I play in a softball league and there was, there was a, a man I met, don't know, know the guy from, from a hole in the wall. He's friends with one, one of my clients slash friends. And so that was how I got introduced to him. And so towards the end of the game, I could tell he kind of had something going on and so I was like, hey, you know, what's, what's, what's happening? And he just opened up to me. You know, he just had a whole lot of stuff going on. And I just, I just help, helped him see. I was like, right now, I was like, hear me out. Right now, you're being selfish. I was like, because you're taking what you went through and you're just making it all about you and your feelings and how you're processing it. You have to take what happened to you, find the lesson find someone else that it happened to and help them get through it. I said, that's how you heal from, from trauma. And just to let the audience know, I am no doctor. I just have almost 47 years of studying human behavior. <laughs> and so it's, it's a fact. And I find that with, like once people realize this thing is bigger than me, you know, so like by you not telling your story and what you did to get to the other side of it, that that's the part that has the power to change and even save someone else's life. So, so once you realize it's bigger than you, people will embrace being vulnerable more. You know, I can, I can see this working because I don't know, I'm sure you've met these people. I, and I know I have, and I know many people have that they always make excuses for why they can't do anything. Yes. And then you tell them, you say, well, look, I did this, this, and this. And I'm not telling you that to say, look how great I am. I'm telling you that I did these things so you can do them. Yes. Or, I'll, or I'll, I'll relay a story of, of someone I know that, that, you know, well, this person went through this, this, and this, and they became this, this, and this. And, and not once did I ever reach him. And I just realized because of you telling me this, it's because <laughs> I'm just, I'm just telling, you know, I'm telling events that happen, but I didn't tell a story to touch them to where that yes. where they could feel it that makes all the sense in the world then then i go okay well then maybe we can reach those people because i often thought until you just said this i thought there are people out there that you just cannot reach and there, and that still may be true because yeah. no matter how <laughs> many you know solutions you come up with they'll have an excuse for you know why that can't work for them Yes. But if you can, if you can reach them and touch them the way you just talked about, maybe, maybe that's the answer to, <laughs> as to get through yeah. everyone. Yeah. So, so as you, you know, I also ha have a podcast and I had a guest on probably 30, 35 episodes ago. She, she, suff she suffers from a condition called systemic lupus. Now, I didn't really know what that was. It's like, I've heard of lupus before, but I, I didn't know that there were different levels to it. So as she's explaining to me what it was, it does some pretty invasive things to, to the body. And so the doctors basically told her that there really wasn't much else she could do. So she just turned to food and she just started you know, doing research on different foods and the healing properties of different foods. And it ended up reducing her symptoms. And so she started sharing her, her story. Like she was unsure at first, cause she's like, you know, this is a very rare disease. Like how many people are gonna really wanna hear about this? So she ended up getting a segment on a local TV, TV station. She told her story. And then a couple of days later, a woman reached out to her on social media and said that she suffered from, from the same condition, was basically told the same thing. Like basically you gotta suck it up. 
you know, because medicinally there's nothing else they could do. But in hearing her story, she was that close to ending her life. And hearing that woman's story and just gave her hope that she doesn't have to suffer the rest of her life. And it gave her a reason to continue living. So like that is the power of telling your story. So when you take the woe is me out of it and you take the like, yeah, this sucks, but this is how I got through it. And you can too. Now it becomes a powerful tool. So when they do this, when, when you teach people how to do this, it's not just, it's not just a powerful tool tool to help others, but it actually empowers you even yes. more is that right yes well yes because now again you you realize once you take the selfishness out of it and i know people hate that term because like oh people grieve in, in different ways like yeah i get that but there's there's solutions so as people grieve in different ways they find the solution in different ways too and one thing that's fail proof let's say people people hold things inside out of fear of what other people are gonna think Right. So once you come to come to grips with that reality that it's bigger than you, that's going to motivate you to want to share your story. Because at the end of the day, people people want to help people. It's like no matter what industry you're in, like even if you're in the tobacco industry, which really just kills people, but you're still helping businesses make money. So, you know, even though it's a bad industry, you're still helping other people earn a living. So it's like you can find the positivity in anything. So I was talking with a woman who was in a violent relationship. And so I just helped her walk through the process. So I was like, just be 100% open and honest with me and just tell me what happened. And then as she's talking, I'm writing things down, like, like I do during my, my podcast episodes, I write things down because sometimes people say things and don't realize that's the power part right there. Right. So as she's going through a story where she's like, you know, I had to, I had to pick up the pieces and prioritize myself. I said, stop right there. That right there is the theme of your story. Not the fact that he was a jerk or that he hit you. You realize you had to pick up the pieces and prioritize yourself. It's like, that's the power part. Cause so like, I don't give people the storyline. I take their story and just help them find the power in it. Nice. Very nice. Well, I know that you offer, which, you know, this is one of the things that I absolutely love when, when uh, someone does this or a company does this is like, you know, people always want money. They always go, Hey, buy my, buy my program. And I go, well, how do I know your program works? You know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> It's you're especially new people who come out with these programs and stuff. And I, and I go, how yeah. do I know what you do works? And so I go, how about this? How about I pay you according to how my, how, when I take your program, it works for me. And, and then I pay you accordingly and nobody wants to do that, but he, yeah. here's what you, do. you actually help people with their first story. Like you do it for free. And I, I go, you know, if, if more people understood that by doing that, that creates so much more business because when they see the power of what you did for their first story, they're going to yes. want more, you know? So yes. I, I, I love that. So there's another woman I had on my show. She created a business helping people get final documents in order. So, you know, when your time comes to move on to the other side, you know, your loved ones who are left behind, they can just click one button and everything that they need is right there. And so as I was going through her website and stuff, I was like, there's like, she mentioned her sister passing away, but it's just kind of vague how my story in Atlanta that time, it, it was vague. So I get her on the show and I don't meet with any of the guests before I interview them. So I want to know as little about them as possible, just so that way things just naturally, naturally evolve, kind of how we're, we're doing this conversation here. And so as we're talking, so I was like, so you started this in response to your sister passing away and you guys were completely blindsided. She was only 36 years old. I said, but what happened? You know, like, and she kind of paused. I was like, you don't have to go there if you don't want to. I said, but given the fact that you started your business because of this event, I think it's important to know what happened. And so she got into it. And then in case, uh, come to find out, 
it was it was her, her husband, her sister, and her sister's husband, and they were getting ready to go out just one night. And so as they're getting ready, the sister felt, I don't remember if it was out of breath or, or her head started hurting. It was one of those two. And so the sister's like, well, why don't you go out on the deck and get some air? And so she goes out on the deck and 30 seconds later, she dropped dead. Wow. You know what I mean? So it's like hearing that, like, see how, see how your head popped up right there? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's a powerful part of that story. So if I'm just listening to her to her speak somewhere and she's just saying yeah i started this it's, yeah it sounds good in theory but when you put that part into it i'm one of seven siblings so when i hear it that way now i picture what if that what if this happened to one of my siblings like what what would we do would, would we be ready you know and so like it just puts it in a completely different perspective when you tell the entire story and it's not like, hi, I'm Rob Foster. I own the gym and I'm a motivational speaker. I say, no, so I change people's lives. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, how do you how do you do that? You know, like it just opens up the curiosity. It's like I change people's lives by taking the things that are already in their in their brain, that are already in the depths of their soul. And I show them how to make it into something that can impact the world. I'm like, doesn't that sound a little bit better than I'm a gym owner and a speaker? <laughs> Absolutely. So, all right. So in telling people's stories, would it be fair to say that, that our stories are powerful because of, of hardships that we, that we had to overcome, you know, that the things that we did, that we've had to um, deal with in life and that, you know, and it shows what we've been able to achieve, maybe not even realizing that we did it. Uh, oftentimes we're, we do things and, and we don't, we don't look at ourselves as being successful, but we go, but if, if you step back and go, how many other people were in your shoes and went through what you went through and didn't come out on the other side, you know? And so would you say that, and, and the reason I'm asking this is because it seems to me that people, and, and I think it's just human nature, people do everything they can to have zero hardship. Like they, like they'll mm. avoid it at all costs. And I go, you know, sometimes you just need to face it head on and, and get through this because it will make you a stronger person. It will, if you come out, it, it will, in depending on what you have to go through, it can change you for your, the rest of your life. And, and when you come out on the other side, you will be a different person. So yes. we say that, that, you know, that helps into, you know, building that story and, and uh, getting that story out there? Yes, it definitely works with positive stories as, as well. But obviously, people have an easier time telling the happy-go-lucky stuff than uh, I, I was assaulted as a teen. You know, they, that's a completely different, different level of vulnerability there. But I'll, I'm going to use a fitness example because in my classes, we, we focus, I focus on endurance. Like, I don't really focus on mu muscle building. I don't really focus on weight loss. I focus on putting people through hell so they can get to the other side of, of the hell. Right. So... Like on Sundays, we do obstacle conditioning. It's an hour long class. And I just set up the most brutal possible circuit that I can. And as they're going through it, I equate it to everyday life things. You know, I was like, all right, okay. So I'm going to have you pull you miss 130 pound female. I'm going to have you pull this 700 pound sled. And they get over there and they're like, how, how can I pull that? I said, you haven't even tried like you just told yourself a story just from looking at the obstacle and right. you didn't even try. I said, so how many times are you doing that out there? How many times are opportunities for you to step up and be the woman that you're capable of being and you don't take it because you don't think you have what it takes? I said, so now I need you to get over there and make yourself proud. It's like, don't do it for me. I said, you're doing this for you. And then they get over there, they stop pulling and they realize they can do it. It's like, oh my God. You know, like we do a lot of Spartan races and tough, tough mutters. Like we actually have one coming up in New Hampshire in a couple of weeks and people, you know, they go on YouTube and they look at the different obstacles and like, oh my God, how, how can I do that? How, I'm like, why don't you say, how can I do that? Right. Instead of that, how can I do that? Because I say it again, in life, someone's going to present you with an opportunity and maybe you're too busy. Maybe you don't have enough money. Maybe the kids' sports schedules might get in the way. So ask yourself, how can I make this happen? You know, it's a completely different train of thought. 
than saying, I won't be able to do that. Then your brain's just going to shut down. Right. So it's the same way when you're telling when, when you're telling your stories, it's like, oh, well, what if I trip up telling the story? Or what if people don't resonate with me? Or what if people laugh at me? What if they don't? Right. Think about that. What if you tell your story so beautifully and half of the audience is moved? Everyone's inspired, but half the audience is moved. And then 20% take you up on whatever it is you're offering. If you can duplicate that, what's that going to do for your life? Right. You know, so that's what can happen from stepping into your vulnerability. It's it's funny because, you know, you make a great point in that it, it takes this different mindset. And and oftentimes I think what happens is we have so many. Well, it's just in our world, period. But we have so many negative people in our lives. And I do I do my very best to if you're negative, I'm sorry, I don't have time for you. I, yes. don't, I don't allow those people in my life. And I tell people, you're going to have to maybe change the, the, the circle of friends or family that you have around you, because yeah. they will bring you down and keep you down if, if, if you allow them to do it. Because these people will always see things in a negative. So like you were saying, have, you know, you have this positive m- mindset of going, Think of reasons why you can do something instead of why you can't do something. Yes. And that and and the negative people will look at that like, oh, you're not being a realist. It's like, yes, <laughs> you are. You just going, I'm going to find a way to do this instead of making excuses about why I can't do it like you do. And exactly. so, you know, again, that's a great point on your part to, you know, that it's it is about the mindset and how you look at things. Yes. In I believe it was 1990. 1999, the year my oldest son was born, I had two birds, two cockatiels. And one of them, well, those first two were super, super sweet. And then one of them ended up getting killed because my ex-wife's daughter, she, I guess the bird was on my backpack. And for some reason, she thought it would, would be smart to shut the backpack. And so the bird suffocated. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so, so, so now we end up moving up to New Hampshire and I saw an ad that someone was selling birds. So I was like, you know what, let me, let me get another one. Cause you know, the bird was grieving cause the two were together and now one's right. gone. And so, so now the first two birds, they were hand fed. So, so they were super, super nice. This third one I got was raised in an aviary. So there was just a bunch of birds flying all over the place. So they didn't really get much human, human contact. And so this one was mean. Like did, didn't want didn't want to be held like like you could couldn't really hold her you, you try to pick her up and she'd peck you and so and she just flying all over the place so I ended up clipping her wings and then it taught me a major major lesson because watching this poor bird try to fly when it couldn't it was heartbreaking it was absolutely heartbreaking and then I started saying. We, we do this to ourselves. Like humans do it to other humans every single time. Like people that listen to my show, I, I mention it maybe, maybe every third show or so, I mention about we clip each other's wings. And it's up to us to not let that happen. So someone's saying, hey, you know what? I think I want to take singing class. Singing classes with that voice, you know? Like, oh, you'll never get out there. Or you, you have stage fright, you this, you that. And like in that moment, you're doing what I did to that bird. You know, that bird has aspirations of taking off flying, knowing that she should be able to take flight. And because of my actions, I grounded her. Well, and you thought you were doing, you probably thought this was the right thing to do. And this is the thing. It's like, I think sometimes the people who are closest to us, our family, our friends, they clip our wings far more faster than, than, than other people. And I tell them, you know, these are, this, these are not the people who are going to be your support system because whether, whether it's intentional or not, they are clipping, you know, for, to use your phrase, they are clipping your wings and keeping you from taking off because maybe your mom's saying, Oh, maybe honey, you don't want to do that because she doesn't want to see you get disappointed or she doesn't want to see you get hurt. It's like, You know, get disappointed, get hurt, learn from those things, you know, yes. and, and, and that's one of the biggest gripes I have with mothers and I love mothers, but they baby their kids, especially nowadays, way too much because they're just trying to protect them. And I get that. But yeah. if you don't let them feel pain, 
they're or, or or feel failure they're never going to succeed they're never going to be happy as long as you keep coddling them and not yeah. allowing them to grow and you know so and, and again i know where it, where it comes from i know it comes from their heart and in a good place but it's still it, it it hurts your kids to do that so yeah they can't build courage or resilience Right. Like you can't build either of those without going through some type of struggle, whether it's pain, whether it's failure, whether it's grief, like no matter, no matter what the adjective is, you need that to build resilience and resilience is everything. Resilience is what's going to help you deal with those naysayers. I believe it's module four in my program. Is, I'm sorry, it's module five is assessing your, your support system where, where, where I go through, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your kids, whether it's your neighbor, coworker, you know, grandmother, you know, relatives go right down the list. I say like the, the opinions of all of them, including your significant other, don't matter. If you are fixated on something that you are passionate about and that can help impact the lives of other people, screw what anyone else Thinks because when I lost my job that day that I mentioned earlier, I, I had started fitness kind of underground in, in my garage, and so I was mad at first. It was the first time I had ever ever lost my job. It was during the recession in two thousand nine, so I get it. But I was like, you know what? I don't have to do this anymore. It's like I don't have to wor worry about not having my vacation cut short because somebody quit or getting called in on my days off, or supposed to leave at five and it's 9.30 and I'm still here. I'm like, I don't have to deal with that anymore. I was like, this is, this is actually a positive thing. I have no clue how I'm gonna build this fitness business, but you know, I have a, I have a good base. Cause you know, I had dropped out, I had dropped out of college. So like, I, I didn't have any, any formal further education beyond a semester and a half at college, but I realized that wasn't the best way for, for me to learn. But little did I know, I learned a lot of stuff as a restaurant manager that I could transfer over right. into fitness. So getting back to the whole assessing the, the support system thing, I had my parents, I mean, my parents, they were supportive, but I could tell they were a little like, bro, <laughs> you know, it's like, you guys have five kids right. and, you know, you're, you're trying to chase this dream. They're like, you know, go do it, but just be smart about it. My, my sister was just like, absolutely not. This is craziness. You got to take care of them kids. And then even my, my, my now ex, even my ex, she was not on board when I first started. Because as you know, when you're an entrepreneur, it takes time. Right. Is that, no. would you say that's a big reason why she might, might be your ex? Um, kind of, kind of, because it was like, if you didn't believe in me enough then, it's right. like once once we started growing and growing and you know started making making decent money, then all of a sudden she jumped on board. But right. just when things were ugly and you know the skies were dark and you know it was foggy, you really you know there was no real clear path. She didn't have my back, and I'll be honest, I think I kind of re kind of resented her for that well, I think because it's, it's it's like it's like you don't have to see what I see, but just believe in what I see. Right. Exactly. You know, and let me go get it. Just believe in you regardless. And I, and, and I, you know, and sometimes I've, I've had to tell clients this and I, and I know it's not something that you want to hear, but I go, if that person doesn't support you, you're not with the right person. I'm sorry. Yeah. You just aren't, you know, if, 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 I mean, it's kind of a, it's a kind of a touchy, it, it's not just a touchy subject, but it's, you have to be careful because what have you, you know, what have you said, Hey honey, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and build a spaceship and go to Mars. And she's like, yeah, baby, I, <laughs> you should probably try to do that. You know? So <laughs> there, there may be cases where, you know, they'll, maybe they shouldn't support it <laughs> depending on how mm. crazy your idea is. But <laughs> my thing is, is like, if you've, if you've always done the things that you say you're going to do, and then people should believe in you. And it, regardless of what, however crazy it may seem, I, I have a great friend right now. He, he owned a, a multi-million dollar business. He's worked his butt off his whole life. And, and, uh, and to, to be able to make sure he gave his, his family a great life. And he said, I'm not doing this anymore. Cause he knew it was killing him. It was physically killing him. And he said, I, yeah. I, you know, I don't want to do this anymore. So he went off on a new venture that, his wife isn't very fond of. And I go, you don't have to be fond of it, but this man proved to you decade after decade 
that he knows what he's doing and that he can, he's always taking care of you. So why would you doubt him? Why would you question anything? Why would you just not go, Hey, I've got your back, baby, you know? And, and, and I, and I, so I go, the phrase I like to use is if you can't change the person, change the person. That's <laughs> and so, love it. Because love I it. You I, succeed. Yes. Like I, I, I want to answer the direct question though. Like why do people do that? Because they can't do it. Right. That's why they put their limitations on you. So they look at the task at hand and say, oh, I wouldn't be able to do that. Okay. This has nothing to do with you. <laughs> so for, for me at that point, in the, in the gym, I remember one of my clients, she, now my girl, I was still training in, in my garage at this time. And so she comes up to me, I was charging 50 bucks a month for three, three days a week. And, you know, cause I didn't know any better then. And so <laughs> I didn't know any better. And so she comes up to me and she starts to hand me the check for the month. And then she pulled it back. She's like, Rob, I just want you to know something. She said, two minutes from my house, they just opened up a brand new, Planet Fitness, spanking clean, I mean, sparkling clean, all new equipment, and it's $10 a month. She's like, I'm giving you five times the amount and driving 20 minutes out of my way because you believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And that's when it hit me that, like, you're on to something. Right. You know, you're on to something. She's willing to pay five times the amount and drive 20 minutes out of her way to come see me for something that you can't even see, <laughs> you know, because like you, like you can't see belief, right. <laughs> you know. But I, but I gave her hope that she could get to where to where she, she wanted to be. So you see, that's what I'm saying. When you make no matter what your industry is, when you make it bigger than what it is, so you can say, yeah, people want to lose weight, they want to get healthier, they want to get in a certain dress size, they want to fit fit in a bathing suit. But I'm like, I'm giving you confidence to do all those things. It's like, that's what we're actually doing here. I am selling you confidence. So you go through this and then you'll become confident to do all those other things. Like you'll improve your self-esteem. You'll improve your self-awareness, which will improve your self-care, which will give you self-love. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Because during, because of the way you teach it, it changes their mindset of how they see themselves. And they understand that what they're going through is a process and that, it's something that they can do because with before you, she probably didn't feel like she could do those things. You know, yeah. I, I'm sure you've had clients like with me, I've had clients who, who, who would never go into the free weight part of the gym. They were too scared because mm. they never had the confidence after training with me. They didn't care what gym they were in. They would go to the free weights and, and be completely confident in knowing they could be there and that they belong there just as much as, as some guy who's 250 pounds and 20 inch arms, you know, they, yeah. didn't, they didn't care. But before mm-hmm. that, they were scared to death to even think about going there. So what, you know, so what you provided for her is that confidence to go, this is who I am. And, it, and she can see herself in a different light. And like you said, now she can begin to love herself as well. Yes. See, also what I, what I, when I teach people, you got to find your strong and especially with females, they look at other females and say, I want that. I want her arms. I want her legs. I want her, her stomach. You know, I'm like, no, no, no. We're going to maximize your gifts. Like everybody's different. Like me, I'm blessed with a fast metabolism. Like if, if I, if I eat super clean for two weeks, I'll drop 50, 15 pounds easy you know it just it just happens you know my brother on the other hand does not have my metabolism and we have the same parents <laughs> you know so, so it's like it's like you just have to find what you're best at like i have this one this one woman she's not the fastest thing on two feet but she's strong you know i said trust me as you're lo- looking at ashley run saying wow i wish i could run like that ashley's looking at you saying i wish i could deadlift like her Right. You know, so like you just have to embrace what you are good at and then take it from good to great. And then the things that you're not that that good at, take it from to not that good to respectable. It's like you just have to be a respectable runner. It's like you don't have to be the fastest one here. But if I send you guys out on a run, I don't care how long it takes you, you to come back. Just complete the run without stopping. Like, that's all I ask out of you. You know, so when I send them on the longer on the longer runs, I split them up. I have my faster them the speedsters. I have my mid, my middle group. I say, "Where's my middle middle of the Packers?" And the slow pokes, I call them my pokies. 
you know, so, so, you know, <laughs> that would be me. I'd be, uh, <laughs> it was like when I first started doing that, some of them were like offended at first. I was like, what, why are you mad? I was like, Ashley, are you fast? She's like, yeah. I said, are you, do you feel a certain way? Cause you're fast. She's like, uh, no. So I was like, uh, Meg, are you fast? No. Okay. Are you ever going to be fast? No. So embrace it. <laughs> you know, it's like, no one's expecting you to, to one day wake up and be a speedster. You know, you're not fast. I just need you to finish the run. Like, I don't care how long it takes you. Exactly. I'd be your slow pokey. That's what I'd be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're right. It's, it's like, it's it, people let the, those the little things like that, you know, hold them back because, you know, they, th- they get offended by those things. I had a client who, you know, he, he thought everybody was looking at him because, you know, he was really self-conscious mm-hmm. and I was teaching him boxing and we were up yeah. in the ring and, and he, and there were people working out around us and, uh, and he was so self-conscious that he thought people were watching him. And he didn't want to do it. And I said, I said, stop. I just said, Hey, you guys down there, are you watching him? And they're like, what? <laughs> I go, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Are you guys watching him? what (laughs) it's like they don't give a damn what you're doing they're too Mm -hmm. busy doing their own thing to care about what you're doing you need to focus on what you're doing and stop worrying about everybody else and once he realized that he he like he just he he grew so fast and became so good at what you know at at doing it he learned so fast that that if if people would just quit letting things like that hang them up from from making that progress and yes. worrying about other people, you're right. They would just, you know, take off. See, and that's in every facet of life as well, right? So I want to share something quick. I was on a panel. It was like a like an international panel. We, we were talking about race relations. And so, and I, I told you the other day when, when, we, when we chatted what my father said, you know, like people will always see the color of your skin, but it's up to you to help them see past it. So like, I've always... To, uh, I've always taken that position. And so <laughs> as I'm listening to the people talk, like there were people from all over, from Africa, from Ireland, England, like people from all over. And so one woman's up there talking and talking and talking. And then I had chimed, chimed in and she's like, so you're trying, trying to tell me you've never been in a convenience store and, and had the cashier looking at you? I said, it's all perspective. I said, you're assuming what they're thinking. I see them looking at me and I think they think I'm cute. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like it, it, it all depends on what spin you put at it. Right. See, see me i'm comfortable with who i am i am comfortable with my skin tone i know i know who i am as a person as an american as a human being nobody else's opinion of me can shake that nobody has that power over me no one does so, so do you, when i walk sorry so when i walk into a store i don't even notice people looking at me because i'm so focused on what i'm there to get so if someone has a problem that's on them that's got nothing to do with me Okay, now I, I'm sorry. I wanted to ask you this question. So, do yeah. you think that because we live in a in a society now in a country? I mean, and again, this may be around the world. I I don't live around the world, so I don't know. But <laughs> but in this country, everybody gets so easily offended. Is it? Do you think maybe it's because they're not sure of who they are? A lot of it is like people are swayed by other people's problems. You know, right. See, it's right. like as, as human beings, we're we're not a monolith, you know. So like if if a white person commits a crime like that doesn't that doesn't have to affect you just because another white person committed a crime like right. that, that person committed a crime. They need to be dealt with. Nothing to do with me. And like especially in the BIPOC community, you know, we want to be all politically correct. It's like if something happens to one person, it's like we're all supposed to react. I'm like, um, I don't know that person. I am not. I am not a criminal. I owe that person nothing. Right. Nothing at all. It's like so. I have no comments on that because people like during the whole George Floyd thing, people were were inboxing me saying, "Yo, you should be speaking out." Like, who the hell are you to tell me what I should speak out on? Right. <laughs> you know, like, it's like I'm entitled to my own opinions of this. And I, I want to say I spoke out maybe six to eight weeks later, but it wasn't on what people expected me to say, <laughs> you know? And so, and, and I got a lot of support on what I had. I know I had a couple of ignorant comments throw, thrown in there, but it's like people are afraid to say what they feel and what they think out of 
the opinions of strangers. That's, that's <laughs> you know, that's what it boils down to. Yeah, they're afraid to they're afraid to be honest, and and they have to and they're doing this identity thing if, if or this tribal thing, if you will. Like you yeah. belong to this tribe, and if the tribe it says this is the way it is you have to agree with them 100 percent. you cannot speak out against them or anything that they say otherwise they will they will cannibalize you they'll ostracize yeah. you they'll, they'll just tear you a new one and then then you'll no longer be a part then yes. i think people are afraid of not having some place to be like not having a, their own tribe to be part of and mm. you're and so it it lends itself to complete dishonesty and disingenuousness when we talk about anything and yes. you and I you're right when you and I talked the other day we talked about both of us you know you're yeah. you, you know you being a man of color and and me being a man who's gay and we yeah. both have had our own tribes if you will come back at us because we won't agree with everything they have to say because guess yes. what they're not right about everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and a lot of the stuff is being pulled into politics. And right. so it's like, you know, no, like I, I step out of that. Like BLM is a direct wing of the Democratic Party, just how the NRA is of the Republican Party. You know, so you say anything about guns, everybody on that side is like, ah, you know, it's like it's it's not that serious. It's like I personally don't think somebody needs 15 automatic weapons in their house like that. That's a little beyond safety. You know, like people forget when the Second Amendment was, was, was written, it took 30 seconds to load to load a gun for one round. Right. 30 seconds. Like that's oh, what it was like when it was written. Like there, there weren't the weapons of today when that, that amendment was written. Right. They, they don't forget. They just ignore it. That's all. Because yeah. it, it doesn't fit their narrative. That's what exactly. To. Well, it's, <laughs> and it's just like on my side, when Pete Buttigieg was running for, for the Democratic nomination, we were supposed to support Pete because Pete's gay. And I was like, I'm not yeah. supporting Pete I, and because he's another to me. And this is my opinion. He's mm -hmm. a corporate Democrat. He will say and do whatever it takes to get to, to progress and, and move up in his, in his career. And yes. he'll do whatever it takes to do that. And someone said, oh, you're just hating on him because, you know, because gay people hate on each other. I go, no, it has nothing to do with that. I go, but yeah. why do you think I should support a gay man who's as big of an oppressor as a white man or a black man or any other man or woman? Exactly. Why would I support them? I don't care if my oppressor's gay. I don't care if they're black, they're white, they're female, male. I don't care. I don't want them. I don't want an oppressor. Yes. You know, so. Exactly. And, like if people, people, people mistake Obama's well-spokenness as he was such a great president. Oh, so yeah. I'm sorry. It's like what, what inner cities were rebuilt under him? Because I'm pretty sure none, yeah. not a one, <laughs> you know? So it's like, if things were so systemically racist, racist, he had eight years to fix it, right? Black man in power. He said, you know, blacks can never do it because we don't have power. We had power for eight years. But did we really? Because the party, it's all about the party. It's not about us. Well, that's the thing. And here's, and here's what I keep, you know, and I go, look, you know, they'll say, well, he didn't have eight years. He had two years. And I go, I don't care. You know, you're right. He only had two years where he controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House, okay? The Democrats had everything. And they said, you still didn't get a damn thing done. I go, that's why you lost the Senate because you couldn't get anything done when you had all three. And the people are like, you're just like everyone else. You're not going to do anything. And which is exactly what happens with both the Republicans and the Democrats. Mm -hmm. They don't do anything. I knew we were going to get off a topic. Here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we said we were going to see what the conversation right. went, right? Exactly. <laughs> so it's like, like with, with that too, though, if, if you pay attention to the pattern, it happens all the time. Like even when Trump won, the Republicans won the House and the Senate, and then the Democrats took it back in twenty in uh, uh, twenty eighteen. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it happened. So now Biden wins, and he won the House and the Senate, and the Republicans will probably take it back in twenty two. Like it's it's almost like it has to happen that way to keep the fight alive. Well, that's what it is. It's because <laughs> you know because then the Democrats can go look. The Republicans had all three branches. They didn't do squat. Let us sit back in there. We'll make changes. Of course, they mm. go in, they don't do squat. You know, now we have all three, all three branches and, you know, and the Republicans are going to say, hey, the, the Democrats have had all three branches for the past two years. They haven't done squat. 
let us back in. We'll make mm-hmm. change. And it's just a game they play, and the people fall for it. Yep. <sighs> over and over i go how many times do you have to get smacked in the back of the head to realize it's the <laughs> guy in front of you smacking you and you, you keep turning yes. around looking for somebody and it's the guy <laughs> in front of you <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah it's like those politicians they're the ultimate storytellers i'll say because people oh, just yes, are. people buy right into a hook line and sinker i'm like and like <laughs> Uh, Black Lives Matter made over a billion dollars, a billion with a B, and people don't even know where that money goes. Right. <laughs> they have no right. clue. It's just like, you know, you click that donate now, now button, and it goes to a site called Act Blue, which is a political fundraising platform. <laughs> it's like that money goes to politicians. Right. And and apparently the 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 now former co- co-founder who was buying buying these houses in white communities. It's like, oh, I thought this was Black Lives Matter about empowering Blacks. Like, with that much money, you could have renovated high schools. You could have, there's just so many different things that could have been done with that money to upgrade the living conditions, to make, like, even here in Rhode Island, there's a road called Broad Street. So you go on one end of Broad Street, you got the water and you got pretty rocks and all the homes got manicured, manicured lawns and the, the Rhode Island Yacht Club is down there. Then you go to the other side of Broad Street, it looks like a war zone, you know, an absolute war zone. So like that part, I can I can understand when people talk about systemically racist because that side looks like that for a reason. That side looks like that for a reason. But that's something that can be fixed. But it's not because if we fix it, then they won't be mad anymore, and then they they won't have to vote for us. It's like that's the part that people of color miss when it comes to these politicians. Well, gay people are the same way; they miss the same. Yeah. It's like you know, we if we get all of our rights, you know, to, and we still do, we're still lacking some. Yeah. Once it's once it's done, then these groups that are out there, um, you know. Where do they go? What do they do? They no longer have a, a, a reason to exist. And and that's and any any you know nonprofit to me, that should be your job is to not exist. And mm. that's not the case. They, you know, they they keep looking for something else to be part of so that they can continue on and continue getting donations and, and it's all about the money. Yep. So, so I'm true. Gonna say, I'm not gonna say they don't do any good. But there are already groups out there who are doing it and you're just riding on their coattails and, you know, just so you have a job. And, and I've seen that in, in, in the gay community. I've seen organizations that pop up and, and ride on the coattails of other organizations that they'll pretend like, you know, like they do a fundraiser. <laughs> and they said, <laughs> oh, we raised $75,000 at this fundraiser. I go, oh, that's great. You just paid the president half of her salary. And you, raise, you know, have another fundraiser and you pay the other half of her salary. And then, hey, then you might be able to start making some money for the foundation <laughs> finally, you know, so. True. <laughs> <laughs> so, so true. It's like, you know, I, I don't have a problem with people making money, helping people. Like if I go back to what I said about, say, Marlboro. You know, that CEO is making millions upon millions to damage people. You know, like c- cigarettes are directly responsible for half of the cancers in the world. And so if they can profit from harming people, I don't have a problem with people profiting from helping people. You know, it's like kind of when you look at it through that lens, it, it makes sense. It's like, why should they not make a good living helping people? Well, I don't have, <laughs> you know, I don't have a problem with people making money as long as they're they're doing something. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, someone who who's who who's the president of HRC, who has done a great deal of work for for um, for gay rights. More power to you, you know. I, but if you get into it just to make money, and then all the donations, like maybe ten percent, actually goes to helping the cause. Mm, the rest of it's all administration. You yeah, set up a business. That's all you did. You know, and, true. and it was the profit. You know, it was to make profit. It wasn't. It wasn't because you cared about the people. Because if you did, you'd you'd streamline this thing to where more. You know, at least seventy percent of what you do would go towards the cause that you're fighting for. Actually, yeah, along those lines, I think it. I think it's the Make a Wish Foundation CEO that makes like six hundred million dollars a year. I want to say oh. <laughs> it's like it's like something something like that, or maybe maybe it's sixty. I don't know, but it's it's a lot of money. Right. You know, it's like, you know, 
maybe two or three. No, you can't live on two or three. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then put the rest of that, you know, to the cause. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, that's an insane amount of money. <laughs> it is. Well, we do you need to talk about your podcast too? Cause you have a podcast as well and it's called shut up and grind, which I love that title. What is, uh, what is your podcast about? Like what you, you know, you talked about having certain guests on it, do you have all types of different guests or you, do you have a certain genre that you're, that you partake in or. Well, the premise of the show is about overcoming obstacles, defying the odds, you know, that kind of thing. And everyone, like I was saying earlier, when we were talking about the story creation, they, there can be power in anything, any, anything. One of the first stories I crafted was about an apple bob contest when I was eight years old. And, and I turned that into a motivational story. And so, so I don't, I don't deny anyone. So like, if anyone wants to be on the show, I put them on because we, we sit here just as we are, we start talking, I take notes and I pull out of them what, what their power is. I just make sure I ask the right questions to get them to go where I want them to go. And this is without knowing anything about them. As I said earlier, I don't pre-screen people at all. So I, I meet them for three minutes before, before we go live. And we just ha have a conversation. Like I kind of browse their website just to see what their what their business is about, and I read the about section to, just to give me some foundation. But I like it to develop organically, like this conversation is. But when I named it back in 2011, I don't know if you remember Blog Talk Radio, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I had a show called Shut Up and Exercise, <laughs> and so I was got I was start. Um, I wrote an ebook also called Shut Up and Exercise. But I wanted, I, I didn't want to just be a fitness guy. So, yeah. so that, that was never my dream. Like I always wanted to either be on TV or I wanted to, you know, be this, this famous speaker, which, you know, I'm getting there, but I wanted it to be about more than just fitness. Like I wanted, wanted it to be about personal development, like helping people find their power or as it says over here, step into your greatness. So I wanted, I wanted something that could encompass everyone. And so I found in the gym, I'm constantly saying, okay, you want this, you need to grind. You want this, you need to stop making excuses and grind. Like, stop, make, shut up. <laughs> you know, it was like, shut up and grind. It's like, I like that. I was like, that's got a solid ring to it. So, so like, no matter what I'm dealing with or who I'm, who I'm trying to work with, all, all those same principles matter. So I had a seven step program that I would help people use whether, no matter what it is they, they wanted to do, if they wanted to run faster, if they wanted to lift heavier, if they wanted to lose weight, whatever it was, I had a seven step process to help them through it. And so I just took that process and I went through each one and I was like, can I make this universal? Because you know the, the gurus always tell you, you got to focus on one lane, focus on one lane. I was like, but I'm good in many lanes. So I'm going to find a way to where I can splice it into one and work with the groups that I want to work with. Because I worked with women's empowerment groups, with inner city youth, with athletes, you know, obviously fitness. And so I was like, which one do I cut out? Do I stop working with inner city youth? You know, do I stop empowering women? You know, it's like, it's like, well, which one are you the most passionate about? I'm passionate about all of them. <laughs> you know, like every single lane is a good lane. I said, so I want to take something to where I can speak to anyone and these seven principles apply. And that's how the show was born. See, I, I completely agree with you. And that was one of the things that held me up when I was younger in life is I had all these, I had all these things that I was good at. And, and like you said, they tell you, find your lane. I was like, but I don't want to just go down one lane, but I was, you know, I'm thinking I have to pick a lane. Right. And yeah. so I did, I picked the one that I was best at now, granted it, it paid off well for me because I, I actually, it was, it's a love that I have and it's a passion I had, but during this time of doing like the personal training I've been doing for so many years, I knew there was more. And that's why this podcast came about because I, I finally realized what you realized is like, I can do more than just one thing. And so even with my podcast that, you know, you, and I'm sure you've heard this as well. They do. They tell you when you do a podcast, okay, what's your format going to be? Well, I have different formats. I have guests, which I absolutely love, 
but then I do shows where it's just me and I give you my perspective. I'm going to start doing shows where I do reaction videos to, yep. to music or movies or something. And, and no one mm-hmm. else does that because they think, Oh, I can't do that because this is what I am. And I'm like, I'm going to do, it's my podcast. I'm going to do whatever exactly. I want to do. <laughs> you know, so yes. I love that. I love the, that, you know, that, that mindset that you have that, you know, just do what you want to do and quit, and quit worrying about what everybody else thinks and and what they're yeah. going to say about it. Yeah, like I said earlier, stop letting people clip your wings. Yeah, <laughs> that's, exactly. that's what it boils down to. It's like just find out what you want to do and do it. Just like with fitness, saying like, oh, you know, you can't have two things going on at once. I'm like, oh, I'm pretty sure I can because yeah. <laughs> I do. I do my classes early in the morning. I take the day off, and then I, I go back and do one class at four four thirty. So that doesn't interfere with anything else during it. I gave myself a six hour gap during the day. So if I have to go speak in a school, I can, or speak at a corporate lunch and learn, I can speak virtually. I can, you know, so I can, I can do both very easily because with, with my fitness now, mind you remember that started out as a hobby. So I never really looked at it as a business. Like I got, I got a business coach and stuff just to help me structure all the stuff I didn't know. And he would always say, well, you know, your ultimate goal here is for you to not work in the business. I'm like, but that's where I belong. It's like, I don't like doing all this other crap. I'm not organized enough for this. Right. (laughs) You know, (laughs) so like, I'm just not. I was like, my power is in the gym when someone is staring at the rope and they're afraid to death. Like that's, that's where I'm needed to give that person the courage to try it anyway. It's like I had a woman, Rob, in about two to three weeks, I'm going to climb that rope. I said, hey, how about we do it now? <laughs> and she's like, well, I said, you don't even know if you're going to be here in three weeks. I know you're here right now. I said, so why don't we go over to that rope and let's get it done? And she's like, yeah, but um, but I, I've never gotten more than a quarter of the way up. And I, I, listen, see that bell up there? You're going you're gonna to wrap in. You're going to inch up one thing at a time until you reach the bell. Don't think about anything else. Don't think about falling. Don't think, think about, about your grip strength. Think about nothing but getting to that bell. And she got over. She wrapped in. I could see she, she was scared. And what she got going, and everyone else in the gym stopped. And we're like, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. And she went all the way up and she rang the bell. That's great. You know, you know it's like, and she was putting limitations on herself. <laughs> you would, you know, the kind of person you are, you wouldn't want to be anywhere else, but there being that person to help yes. them out. And you, you know, not, you wouldn't want to hire someone to do that for you. That's what you love. And that's what you enjoy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's the part that lights me up. Yes. You know, when when exactly. people, they, they walk in and they see the setup and they're like, crap, you know, <laughs> but then there's, but then they, they, you know, but give it some time. Then they walk in, they see the setup and they're like, let's get it. Yeah. That's the moment I love right there when they go from oh crap to let's get it. I was like, nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, for um, so that my viewers and listeners know, I'm actually going to be on Robert's show here in uh, in a couple of weeks, and uh, so I'm I'm a days. excited. Yeah, is it a couple of days? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah like, August fifth. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be <laughs> August. Oh my god, it's already the end of July. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it because, you know, you, you've got me um, excited about this where I go, I want to step into my greatness. So. <laughs> Love it. So I'm see, and, that. see and, and, and I want to just define that because when I say st- help, help you step into your greatness, like I didn't just say to help you step into greatness, right. it's kind of, kind of like with success, it's subjective. Right. You know, it's like we, we spoke about this off air the other day, whereas for me, I don't have like materialistic needs and I'm not knocking the people that do. If you need the fancy bag and a fancy car, you, you do you. Just me personally, I don't need that stuff. Right. So what, what, what I wanted was from all those years I spent managing restaurants and the family functions I had to miss and the kids after school things I had to miss and the sporting events I had to miss or leave early. I was like. No, no. As I, as long as I have these, these these kids in the house, I'm not missing anything, anything at all. I'm going to be in control of my schedule. When I want to go hike, I'm going to go hike. When I want to take a getaway to Florida or North Carolina or California, I'm going. 
Like, I just want full control of what I do. I don't want to have to ask anybody permission. I don't want to have to check with so-and-so. I'd be like, hey, can any of you guys cover Saturday? No? Okay, no classes Saturday because I'm going hiking. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that, that's just, that's just how, how that works. Like, and, and, and my clients know that. Like, I was up front with them. I said, make sure you guys check the schedule week to week because things could change. I said, just so you're aware, put it out there. Right. You know, and... So like not to spin off in this direction, but I donated a kidney to my sister in 2011. And as we were going through that process is the first time I really felt my mortality. Mm. And I was like this, you know, with my, my ex, I, I didn't have the best relationship with her side, her side of the family, just very, just very negative, you know, and I'm very positive, you know, so unless you're, you're a battery positive and negative, just don't mix. And so I, I, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to, to those functions anymore. Like, I'm not doing anything that doesn't serve me ever again, you know? And so that's just where I started adopting that mentality. I, I was like, I'm going to be in control of what I do from now on. Like, you, you're getting married. That's great. I'll send you a gift. I ain't going to the wedding. Not doing it. Like, if it hurts your feelings, if you're thinking about me on your wedding day, you ain't with the right person. <laughs> so, it's like you shouldn't even notice that I wasn't there. <laughs> right. I, 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 the same way, and I and I would go. You know, I don't know if I don't. You just get to a point where you go, I'm not doing this anymore. You realize, yes, you're, like you said, your mortality, and you go, I don't want to do these things. I'm mm -hmm. not going to do it. Why, why do I feel like I have? To, I'm obligated to do something that I'm going to be miserable doing. Yeah. Why do that to yourself? And so, you're absolutely right. People should go look because. <laughs> Because I'm thinking, like you, you, you brought up a wedding. If I go to someone's wedding, I don't want to be there. Do you think I'm going to make their day happy? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I do them any, yes. I do them any favors, really? You know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's like, why am I going to go somewhere I don't want to be? You're going to pick up on the fact that I don't want to be there. Right. <laughs> you know? so, so it's like that's just another fight waiting to happen. I would just rather not go. Right. And you if, know, so if they still want you there, then they're, they want you there for the wrong reasons. They want you there yes. to show off to go, oh, look at the number of people who came to yes. my wedding. They, they don't exactly. care about you. They just look at you as a head, another head that they yep. can count and go, oh, there's I another know. hundred bucks. Right. <laughs> 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 well, you know, the funny thing is, is as, as you were talking, uh, I'm, I'm listening because uh, as many people know, I'm writing a book and, uh, and it's, a, and it's about, it, very much what you what you what you believe and what you teach and that is that you can become anything or get or have anything at any time in your life and be whatever you want to be achieve whatever you want to achieve at any time in your life and so i was i realized that a lot of the things you're saying are the things i'm saying and the difference is is your story is yours and my story is mine. And we yes. have different stories and people, there are going to be different people who relate to my story and your story. And so there's, even though we may have the same message, because I think that there are universal truths out there that you go, this is what you have to do if you want to achieve these things. And, and you know, yes. you've mentioned many of them today. And, I, and so for me to not have those, I'd be going, oh, wait, I didn't have that. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, because you know the, these universal truths are the same for you and for me, and we're teaching people these things, I think it's the stories that 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 we bring out, and and that's an area that I personally I think I I could use some work on. So I'm really happy that uh, that I met you, and and again, awesome. I have to thank I have to thank Lisa. Uh, David Olson. She's, yes. uh, she's just an amazing person. And she, she's hooked me up with a few amazing people like you. And I just, I can't thank her enough. You know, she's just another one of those positive people that, yep. that, uh, that was a guest on my show and just uh, uh, blessed for having her on here. Yeah. She thought of you immediately. Did so she? like towards, towards the end, cause I told her I was going to connect her with a couple of people too. And she's like, Oh, I got this guy. He's big into fitness. He's like, it's like, you guys, you guys are definitely gonna, gonna mesh, <laughs> you know? And she was right. <laughs> yeah, she, 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 she's, she's, you know, she's a, you know, the thing is, is that she's very thoughtful. Like she's always thinking about other people. And I love that about her. her husband is the same way. Just a, just a, a great guy. Um, you know, one of the things that they, they've helped out with is that um, I've, I'm big into uh, 
rhinos. I love rhinos. And so I'm setting up this, this, uh, this program for this rhino orphanage over in South Africa to protect the rhinos. And it costs them a fortune to take care of these rhinos. And so I want to set something up so that we can help, you know, help this rhino orphanage out, you know, in, in paying the bills that they've got to pay just to just keep the doors open. And, uh, and her husband made this design for a shirt that, that, um, that's coming out uh, very soon. And he just did an amazing job and just in, in, and the time that he donated to do this, I go, you know, you don't find people like that very often who are that selfless and, and willing to help out, you know, someone else's cause or some, or, or someone else and, and think about other people. And, and they're just great people because they both do that. So, yes. so I, I'm really appreciative. I'm really glad that I met her and, uh, and had her on the show. Funny woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, and you'll, you'll be, be surprised where these connections lead. But there's one, one thing I wanted to mention, the good thing about this virtual stuff and being able to be international is I've had guests on, you know, who are white, who are black, who are Hispanic, Asian, India, like Asian, Indian, American Indian, like pretty much everything, Jewish, um, Muslim, Buddhist, like people from all over, every possible Every, I think I haven't had a transgender on yet, but I'm sure at some point I'll have one on. But the point of sharing that is everybody wants the same thing. Right. As I go through and I get everyone's story, people want to accept, they want to be accepted, they want to be happy, and they want to they wanna help others. You know, like everybody, was, I spoke to the woman from Thailand and she gave me that same story. The woman, the woman and the man from Australia, same thing. The Israeli immigrant, the same thing. The, the woman from South Africa, same thing. Here in the U.S., same thing. Right. You know, so like whenever people say, you know, we're also different, but we're we're diverse. With it, like, no, we're not. We just have different skin tones. All you know, if you see a cat, you know, this black cat, this calico cat, this white cat, this gray cat, we just say, oh, look at the cat. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like from the different parts of the country is why we look different. You know, like I'm sure pasty white people would have a rough time in Africa where it gets 130 degrees. You know, it's like that's why that's why Africans have such darker skin to deal with the elements of the sun. You know, it's like at the end of the day, we are all the same people. We're all human. Like I hear people in the black community say all, all the time, you know, they need someone that looks like them. I'm like, um, I have two eyes. White people have two eyes. I have two ears. White people have two ears. I have one set of lips. They have one set of lips. One nose, one nose. You know, so because our skin tone's a little different, we're not different species. <laughs> you know, it's like we are all human beings, no matter where we are in this world. The one trait that we all share is that we're all human, <laughs> you know, and we all we all have those same basic human needs. And once we realize that and stop letting these politicians control our emotions, that's when we can truly have unity. Do you resonate this the the voice of uh, another guest I had on just a couple of weeks ago, his name is Ant, and he's very much like you, just a positive guy. And he said, you know, race is made up. He goes, that's it. He goes, I'm uh, meeting with Ant Monday. Oh, are you? Great. Yeah. He's such a great guy. <laughs> Seriously, I, I told him, I said, I wanted to do, he was someone I met and I go, you know what? Him and I are going to be friends. <laughs> I just knew it. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a great guy. Yeah. So you'll, I think you'll like him. And, uh, and in fact, I know you will tell him I said, hello. So. We'll do. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, you said his name like am like that that rings a bell. Yeah, because Lisa connected me with him as well. Yeah, he's a he's a great guy. He seriously is. And he's 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 very much like you, just a positive guy. And he believes the same way that you believe, that I believe, and that Lisa believes, you know, we're we're just humans. And yeah, and and, and he he'll make some really great points that you that to you when when you uh, talk to him. And yeah. I'll let him, I'll, I won't tell you what, you know, what he said, cause he'll, he'll tell you. And then, you yeah. know, Oh, that's really brilliant. So <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people if I went into cardiac arrest, I want the first person around me that knows CPR to save me. Right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll wait. No, you're dead. Never mind. I'll die. 
<laughs> it was how stupid that sounds. <laughs> you know what? There are people who would say that. Then, and this is true. Like, oh, you're black? No, I'll die. There are yeah. people who would say that. And I'd go, well, you know, you deserve to die then. <laughs> so. Yeah, for, for, for real. It's like, you know, when I'm in a jam, I want the closest person to come help me. That's like people on the streets with their defund the police signs. And then things get crazy and then they call the cops right. <laughs> it's like come on it's like can't you see how stupid this message is <laughs> thing, you know, i i had another guest on we were talking about um, postmodernism, and they don't see the ridiculousness of their of their stance they just don't and yeah. and it's I, I don't know because they're not smart enough or they just don't want to you know even when we talk about because they they their whole thing is that every system is oppressive yeah. and I go yes it is that's part of living in a society you don't get to do everything you want to do just yes. because you want to do it if yeah. you did then we had nothing but chaos and we wouldn't have a society I go yeah. but you understand that by you trying to incorporate your beliefs into a system you're oppressing people who don't believe like you. So yep. you're just as oppressive as any other system out there. Exactly. But they don't, they just don't get that. You know, so yeah. And people forget too, back in the hunter gatherer days, it was kill or be killed. Right. <laughs> it's like that's that's a human instinct. It's kill or be killed. When it comes down to it, if it's about protecting my household and protecting the, the whole neighborhood, I'm zeroing in here first. <laughs> it's like, you know, me and my children, like that's my top priority, you know? So if something's going to enter the fray that could disrupt the safety of myself and my children, then no, that takes precedent. That's human nature, like that's part of it. And that's yeah. I'm sorry, and that's the thing is they don't they don't take into account human nature. So all the ills and uh, that they that they are finding right now, they want to blame on one group or another. And it's yeah. like it's not one group or another because everyone has done these things. Every group has done exactly. these things. It's hu It's our. It's in us. It's it's in our DNA. It's who we are. And I'm not yep. making excuses for it, but I'm saying you've got to look at the bigger picture and you can't just point fingers and go, Oh, it's this person's fault or that person's fault or it, it, because it's not, it's who yeah. we are as a, as a species. And yes. History proves that out. So. Yeah. I mean, like we started this, it's not what happens to you. It's how you respond to it. Right. That that's how it becomes a story. Like, like I was telling you the other day, you know, I was born in New York city. I was raised up here in rural Rhode Island and <laughs> You know, my parents had an apartment in Brooklyn. It caught fire when my mom was pregnant with me. And they ended up having to move into the housing projects in Queens. And my dad was like, this ain't happening. <laughs> He's like, this is not happening. So he could have just played the woe is me card. This is where I have, this is where I have to live. You know, they had to get on government assistance. And, and my dad was like, this is not happening. And he came up here to Rhode Island for six months, got a job, saved money, bought a house, went back to New York City and got us out. You know, it's like he took matters into his own hands. He didn't wait for a system. He didn't wait for the government. You know, he didn't wait for some savior to come and rescue his family. He's like, I have to do this. And then once people realize that, that's when their life will change. But as I stated earlier, People want to latch on to other people's problems. Right. So it's like, oh, no, see, well, what happened to this person? See, that right there, that's systemic. It's like, um, no, that person made a series of decisions that led him to get to that point. It's like, as an accountability coach, I like to get to the bottom of things. Like, this guy tried to come at me on Twitter over the George Floyd, Derek Chauvin thing. And he was just writing all these things out that Derek Chauvin did did wrong that could have kept George Floyd alive. And I just wrote one sentence and set that whole thread on fire. I just had, had George Floyd stayed in the back of the car. It would have never escalated to that point. True. But <laughs> I will say this, having been a police officer and in, in, in my early career, I will say this, that police officers nowadays go from zero to a hundred way too fast. You're you, when you're doing when you're doing a stop it doesn't go from you talking to the person to pulling the gun out 
there are yeah. steps that you go through and they don't do that anymore because they've been they've been brainwashed into believing that everybody wants to kill them so there's no such there's no nice people anymore they don't treat anyone as if they're nice they treat them all as if they're a threat to their life now you could argue that well that's what they got to do to stay alive i would say if you're that scared you really shouldn't be doing that you really shouldn't be in that business now you're right george floyd should have stayed in the car but when he got out and you had subdued him and handcuffed him there was no need to stay on him no oh, i'm not i'm not saying any of that any of that's right like Ch chauvin should definitely get whatever the max penalty is for what he did but just as an accountability coach that's where it started like had he stayed in the car it would have never escalated to that point now we talked about this just a little bit a, a couple of days ago and, yeah. and I, and I brought this point up, so I would like to hear, and again, I know this doesn't have anything to do with what we were talking about, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one of the things I told you, I said, you know, when George Floyd was a child and his teacher had given the class, you know, this, this uh, exercise to say, Hey, when you grow up, what do you want to be? Mm -hmm. And George Floyd had written that he wanted to be, now he didn't say Supreme court justice because he didn't know what it was called, but he described yeah being a Supreme Court justice, that he wanted to put bad people in, in jail and stuff and, and, and that kind of stuff yeah, um, and make laws. And, uh, and I don't really remember how it was directly worded, but it, it, it lent itself to say, I want to be a Supreme Court justice. And I said, somewhere along the line, the system failed him. Not just, and, and I don't want to blame it completely on the system, but you could say, well, his parents failed him. But if we look and go, where was his parents? Was his was his parents, you know, caught up in the system? And and so, um, so when you say accountability, you because you you do hold people accountable, and I think it's important to go. Yes, these things happened, and something happened to George Floyd between the time he was that child to becoming a, an adult and a career criminal. But at some point, we all have to make this decision in our lives to go. Yes, these things happen to us, but we can't use that as an excuse for the rest of our life to do things that we know we shouldn't be doing. At some point, we need to accept responsibility for our own actions, and I think that's where we miss the boat. What would you say? And, and I think that this is this is still on topic because we're still talking about personal personal accountability. And I'll share what I'm going through with my son. So this past Super Bowl, February 9th or 10th, whatever day it was. So I was watching the Super Bowl. I had just, you know, finished drink, drinking some wine, lay down to go to bed. And then my daughters are banging on my bedroom door. And so I'm like, what? Because they know to, to, not, to not bother me. It's right. like, like the house better be on fire for you to wake me up. Right. So I'm like, what? And they're like, CJ's in trouble. Like C CJ called. I was like, oh, okay. I was like, and? And? It's the Smithfield police station. I said, he got himself in. He can get himself out. And she's like, you're not going to call him? I said, no. I said, because I've told all of my kids ever since they, they were able to comprehend about how to stay on the right path. If you choose to step off of that path, do not call me. I said, do not. Because I spent my entire life showing you the right way. So if you choose to step out, you will get yourself out of it. So... I, I did listen to, to his voicemail and then I didn't. Right. And so he ended up getting himself out and then he had, he had nowhere else to go. Like he and his, he and his, his ex had a little domestic altercation. So they ended up, you know, taking, taking him. And so he, he was here. I actually went upstairs to go to the bathroom and he was here. I didn't look at him. I didn't talk to him. He tried to talk to me. I said, mm, Nope. And so I went downstairs and I went to bed. So now it was the next day. Well, because as I said, I was drinking some wine too. So, you know, I yeah. like, let me talk to you when I'm completely of sound mind. But so that next day he's telling me she, this, she, that, she, this, she, that, she, this, she, that. And I just interrupted him. I said, did you hit her? And he's like, no, uh, and like my kids can't lie. They can't lie to me at all. And so I was like, did you hit her? And like, I could tell by his response that he didn't. Like he had scratches and bruises all over him. And so I said, before you finish the story, you did this. I said, no matter, I don't care what she did. 
I was like, I told you months ago, she's got a couple screws loose and you chose to not listen to me. I said, she's come at you before and you chose to stay with her. And he's like, yeah, but why did they take, why did they take me? Because, because my skin, like my kids are mixed. So like, they're not, I mean, I'm not dark, dark, but they're a lot lighter than I am. But even still, he tried to play the, oh, oh, oh it's because I'm, I'm a black kid in Smith. I said, uh-uh, no, that has nothing to do with it because the cops weren't around when you two got into that fight. I was like, you did this. You put yourself in the position to where the cops had to be called. You know, so like, so to answer your question, that's what was missing from the time George Floyd wrote that through his teenage and adult. Somewhere along the lines, he didn't have guidance. To me, that's not a system problem, right? He didn't have guidance. And so, I mean, you can argue the education level in the inner city schools, but you can also look at the other side of it and say that there's more problems in those schools and they don't really attract the right teachers. So like that, that issue definitely needs, needs to be addressed. Cause I know when I was going to school, you know, our teachers were very, they were very supportive. So even while we were there six hours a day, but I still feared, feared my parents. So it's like, you know, I knew don't do any of that. See, being the youngest of seven, I got to watch the other six screw up. And so I'm like, ooh, okay, don't ever, don't ever lie about when I'm coming home. Don't ever try to sneak out. Don't ever come back late when dad has to go, go to work. Right? I banked all those things into memory. But I had a lot of guidance with my parents. And, and like conversations like I just outlined with my son, my dad, would, and both of my parents would have with, with us all the time. And so everything, no matter what it was, it was our fault. And then even now on my, on my uh, wall over here, I have the core values for my mastermind program. And number one is everything is your fault. It's like, you're not going to change your world if you keep blaming everyone and everything for where you are in life. Well, and that's, that's one of the things I see. I want to, I want to say, look, let's, I wish somebody would do this. And if anybody's listening, who has the capabilities of doing this, if somebody goes and looks at George Floyd's story, looks at it, honestly, not building him up to be something that he wasn't not just, you know, not destroying his character to something that he wasn't, but being yeah. telling an honest story of here's this kid. Here's what he wanted to do. What happened along the way. Now yeah. I don't want to make excuses for George Floyd, but if, you know, if he didn't have parents and you know, that, that were there that support him to take care of him. if one of it, if his father was in prison for drugs or whatever, mm. I don't, I don't know that. I'm just saying if he was, those would all affect him, but it comes down to regardless of what happened to him. It comes down to what you said right there. You have to take personal responsibility at some point in your life because it is your fault if you don't. But I, but I would ask you this, how is it that some people have that ability to to take responsibility and, and go you know what robert you're absolutely right i get what you're saying and i am responsible for me and yet there's so many others who don't the majority of them don't so think about your the jobs you have had in your life like not your business but your jobs have you worked for a really strict manager slash boss and have you worked for a more lenient manager slash boss because i know for me the more strict managers that i've worked with we had way more productivity from the staff and then from the more lenient one there it was more just blah blah, blah you know with getting stuff done so to answer the question using those two illustrations it comes down to what you're taught so if you're taught that police are bad if you're taught to not listen to them, you know, if you're taught to just X, Y, Z, like if, if you're not taught to wait till till marriage before, you know, having kids, it, you know, like whatever is your value system in your household, that's what you're going to hold near, near and dear. So if you if you have parents telling you, you know, you're not going to be able to have anything but these streets out here and, you know, I got to make you tough enough to, to survive these streets, like that's what you're going to think. No, because there are many people who are raised in the inner city that have gone on to do great things because they had that 
foundation at home of saying, listen, we're here now, but we ain't going to be here forever. Right. And then you have the other side saying, this is all we're ever going to have. And both sides are right. So whatever you believe in, that's the path you're going to lead. Exactly. Exactly. Um, it was Henry Ford. I think you said, you know, whether you believe you can or whether you believe you can't, you're right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Down. Right. And another case in point with my nephew, he, he, right around 14, he started running with the, with the, with the wrong crowd and started getting into, into drugs and stuff. And now he, now my nephew and my son, they were both very close. And once all of this started coming, cut him right off. Like my sister would, would, would call me like, hey, you know, uh, can C CJ sleep over this week? I said, hell no. <laughs> I was like, your boy has been in and out of group homes. Hell no. And she's like, but their family. I said, I don't care. I was like, my job is to protect him. Right. I said, so when your boy gets his, his head screwed on, right? Then we'll talk about that. I said, you know, we'll show up to family functions and stuff, but he is not sleeping over where I'm not, I'm not around to monitor their actions. I said, absolutely not. And like, th those are decisions that you have to make as a parent when you're trying to keep your kid on the right path. So I'm not going to let him go spend the night with a kid that's not on the path. <laughs> you know, and a lot, a lot of parents, they don't have the spine to make that decision. Oh, well, I don't want someone so to feel bad. I don't want to upset my sister. I don't want to upset their parents. I'm like, no, I want, I want to keep my kid doing the things I spent the last 14 years teaching him. You know, I'm not going to let someone else erase all of that hard work because of your feelings. Right. Like, no, my job is to raise my children. You know, it's not to, it's not to do what you want me to do. And just one, one more quick one, when my daughter and her now ex-boyfriend, they both got accepted to a college up in Massachusetts. And then my daughter also got accepted to, a, to a, the University of Rhode Island. And so I took her for, for a walk. I live by a state park over here. So I said, come on, let's go for a walk. And so I was like, so what are you thinking about with college? And she's like, well, you know, he got accepted to LaSalle. She's like, you know, and I really like the school. I said, okay. I said, let me just paint you a picture. Because he's another one that, that I kind of told her. I was like, there's some red flags here that, that you're missing. I said, I'm not going to intercede. I said, just pay attention. And so, but, but I told her, I was like, just let me paint, paint this picture for you. Because my daughter's kind of introverted. And so I said, so you go up there. The only one you're going to know is him. I said, heaven forbid something happens between you two. What is that going to do to you? I said, when you can go to URI, right? They have a great, a great program down there for kinesiology. You know, you'll be closer here if you need to, if you need to come. Well, COVID ended up taking away her, her freshman year anyway. Oh, her sophomore year anyway. But I was like, no, you're closer to here if you need to come to come home. But as far as far enough away to where you know you can learn to grow up and you know be on your own. Because I could have just had her commute, but I wanted her to live there so she could learn to to become more you know more independent. But anyway, but but I painted that picture for her. I said, now I'm not going to tell you what to do. I said, but we're not going to commit to this university for X amount of dollars for some boy to screw it up. I said, so take some time, think about it. Let me know what you want to do. And then so two weeks went by and she comes to me and she says, so I was thinking about what you were saying. She's like, and I'm going to go to URI, you know? So it's like, you, you have to give the kids the opportunities to do the right thing. Right. Like there's a difference between just being around and guiding the kids, right? So let me just tell one more quick one. So on, on the tail end now, my son's case has been dragging in court. So he, he originally went the end of February, okay? We're getting ready to go into August. And so he's the type, he just waits for life to happen to him. And so once his case got continued for like the fourth time, I was like, what is going on? Like, what is your lawyer saying? He's like, oh, I, I haven't spoken to him. I'm like, what do you mean you haven't spoken to him? I was like, do you think this is just going to happen? I was like, no. I'm like, you have a public defender. I said, his job is not to, his job is to just get your case done. I said, he's not working on your behalf because you ain't paying him. You know, I said, that's why your case keeps getting kicked to the curb because he's probably taking other cases that he's being paid for. 
I said, you need to get on him and so we can get this done. I said, because as of right now, there's still a possibility they could convict you. <laughs> you know so and he's like but i didn't do anything i said that's not how the law works bro i said i said you've seen training day you you heard denzel it's not what you know it's what you can prove right you know i said and as of right now she's saying you did xyz i said so he finally gets in touch with the lawyer a couple of days goes by and he messages me he's all he's all mad all loud caps and mad faces and everything and he's like they he's like they want me to pay five hundred dollars and to take, I was like, I don't know, four, four, six, four or six um, anger management classes, and then they'll drop the charges. And I said, so what, what are you mad about? You pay 500 bucks, you take some counsel, which you clearly need, and the case goes away. And he's like, yeah, but she broke this or she broke that. I'm like, it doesn't matter. I was like, there comes time, times in life where it's better to be at peace than to be right. Right. I said the whole purpose of this thing in court was for you to not have a record. I said, so you're going to sit here and try to fight over something so stupid. And for what? So you can be right. I was like, take the deal and make this go away. And so then he ended up getting it down to three hundred dollars and four counseling sessions. And so he says, I'm going to do it. He's like, you know, you're right. Like this just needs to go away. Right. You know, like, and that, that's the difference between just being someone who has a kid and someone who's actually raising their kids. Well, yeah. And you just said, you know, you let, like, you give him advice and then let, or, and even your daughter, you give them advice and let them make those decisions because yes. they have to learn. You can't, you, you know, you, well, you can, but I don't think the best form of parenting is forcing your kids to do everything because when you're yes, not, or doing everything for them, right. You know, if, if you go, you're going to do this, well, they're always going to do it. You know, they may do what you tell them to do because you're forcing them to do it. But one day when you're not around to force them, you know, yes. they're, they're going to be lost. They're not going to know what to do because you're not there to tell them and they'll make exactly. wrong decisions. They need to learn how to make their own decisions. So I think that's, that's great on your part. So thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, I will tell you, uh, this was a great conversation. I loved it. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> I, 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 I really appreciate what you do. I, you know, I hope that um, you have a website. You, in fact, why don't you just tell people and for everyone knows I'm going to put your website. I will put your, uh, your uh, social media uh, stuff down at the bottom. So everybody who wants to, who wants to go and meet you and, 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 and see what you do they'll be able to click on there and, and go to, to your different sites. Okay. But why don't you tell Appreciate them, uh, you know, for like people who are listening right now and maybe not viewing this, um, what your website is, what your, you know, and any other social media that you'd like to put out there for you. Absolutely. Yes. It's Robert B foster.com. And through that site, I offer a free 15 minute call where I help you take something that you're having trouble articulating and we turn it into a story. And really, don't, it only takes 15 minutes, maybe even less. So, and that's something that can, it can change, it can change you, <laughs> you know, learning how to take that thing and vocalize it in a way that can help other people. So you, you're going to be able to help other people and you're going to, you're going to heal from it yourself. So definitely take advantage of that because a lot of places wouldn't do that for free, but I want you to see the power, not even in what I do, the power that you have hiding in you. I want to help you bring that out. And then with my so social channels, it's honestly, it's best to go through my website because again, I'm an accidental entrepreneur. So <laughs> I have I have different handles for everything. Right. <laughs> so, so through my website, I have the different social links right on there. Okay, so robertbfoster.com. Yes. And I also have a free Facebook group and the uh, direct access says speak about yourself.com. And that'll bring you right to the group where again, I, I help people just overcome, overcome the fear of, of public speaking. Cause once we craft a story, you got to be able to tell the story. <laughs> so just in the group is where we'll, we'll practice you, you know, getting in front of other people in the group and sharing your story. Well, like I said, you know, I'm going to be on your show here in a few days. I am yeah. so excited and looking forward to uh, to learning a thing or two about telling my story or, or and finding out what it is, what my story really is that I want to put out there. So I'm yeah. looking forward to it. So, well, awesome. Luther, thank you very much. It was it was a pleasure, and uh, and again, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I and I loved it. I loved the fact that 
again, you and I could go off on different tangents and different topics and come right back. <laughs> so, it, so it was to me, whenever we can do that, it's a great show. So <laughs> uh, absolutely. And you know what that shows is that we're, we're in touch with our central message, because even though we broach different topics, the central message never changed. That's right. You're, <laughs> that's, that's a very valid point. You're very, yes. very true. Yeah. Well, very good. I'll see you in a few days then. Yes, sir. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you. Too. Hang on one second. Okay. Well, that's our show. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, again, thanks to Robert for, for, uh, for being the guest on the show today and, and, uh, and dropping all those words of wisdom for us and go check out his, go check out his site, robertbfoster.com. Take him up on, in, on his, uh, on his free offer. You have nothing to lose. You could, like if it's free, you have everything to gain. So take him up on that and, uh, and, uh, give him and, uh, take a look at him and see what he's got there. So it, great guy. <laughs> so, all right. So until next time, take care, be safe and go back to wearing your mask. You don't want that new, variant going out around there whatever <laughs> so <laughs> see you later bye